During a snowstorm in 1982, a man on board a commercial plane looked out of his window and saw something very strange at the top of a Colorado mountain. When authorities were alerted and sent to that spot on the mountain, they could not believe what they found there. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload once or twice every week. So if that's of interest to you, please invite the like button to participate in your nice casual... <laughs> the like button to participate in your... <laughs> participate in your very fun, very casual neighborhood squirt gun fight, but then squirt the like button with, but then squirt them with sulfuric acid, but then squirt the like button with sulfuric acid, not water. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. In 2018, a 56-year-old father of four named Taeb Suyami was living in a quiet, modest town in New Jersey called Little Ferry. Taeb had moved to the United States from Africa back in 1996, and after getting settled in New Jersey, he had landed a job as an accountant for a food importing company. At first, Taeb's salary had been enough to provide for the family, but as his family grew, his salary just wasn't enough and money became a real problem. And so so eventually, Taeb's wife also got a full-time job, but even then, with two full-time working adults, the family had to stay on a very strict budget just to make ends meet. And that year, in 2018, one of Taeb's daughters was getting ready to go to college, and so Taeb was forced to refinance his mortgage just to make the initial payments on his child's college bills. But despite his financial struggles, Taeb did not let it bother him. He was an eternal optimist who fundamentally believed that in the end, everything would just work itself out. On May 1st of that year, Taeb was on his way home from work when his wife called him and asked if he would swing by the grocery store and pick up some orange juice. So Taeb stopped at the ShopRite grocery store in Hackensack, New Jersey, which was only a couple miles north of Little Ferry where they lived. And he went inside, he went to the juice aisle, and he scanned the different brands of orange juice. And at some point, he grabbed the most appealing orange juice that was still within their budget. It was $5. He takes the juice, he goes goes to the front of the store, he pays for it, he goes outside, he hops in his car, and he heads home. When he pulls into his driveway, he gets out, he goes into the house, he goes right into the kitchen where his wife was, and he proudly set the orange juice down on the kitchen table, expecting a thank you from his wife. But his wife turned around, and she looked at the orange juice, and she saw the brand he had purchased, and she immediately said, how much did you pay for that? And Tayeb said, five dollars and she said well you got to take it back because i know that brand is on sale for two dollars and fifty cents at the grocery store right down the road so go return this one and so Tayeb was totally annoyed because he just got home from work he thought he had done a good deed and now he's in trouble and so he decided you know what i'm not going to fight her on this he just walked over grabbed the five dollar orange juice and he went back outside hopped in his car and took off a few minutes later, he arrived at the Hackensack, New Jersey ShopRite. He went inside and he went straight to the customer service desk where there was a teenager behind the counter and Taeb walked over to them and he handed them the juice along with his receipt and he asked for a refund. And so while Taeb is standing there letting this cashier complete the transaction, he looked behind the cashier at the wall and there was this sign that totally piqued his interest. And so he's staring at the sign and then finally the teenage cashier, he finishes the transaction and he he reaches out across the counter with Taeb's five dollars and Taeb he reaches out and he takes the five dollars but then he pauses for a second and he's kind of looking up at the sign and he's thinking about what he should do and he knows that if he does this if he does what the sign is telling him to do he's going to get in trouble with his wife because this is the exact opposite of what he was sent out to do but Taeb just couldn't help it and he takes the five dollars and he proceeds to hand it right back to the cashier and he tells the cashier what he wants him to do with it. And so a couple minutes later, Taeb leaves the shop right with no juice, with no five dollars, 
but two small slips of paper in his back pocket. And so Tayeb hops in his car and he drives to the grocery store that's right down the road from their house. He goes inside and he gets the on sale $2.50 bottle of orange juice. And then he goes back into his car, he drives home, he goes in the kitchen and he sets the juice on the counter and tells his wife, yep, I got the right one, $2.50. And he's just hoping the whole time that she has not checked the bank account and has not discovered what he had really been doing while he was out because he had actually spent more money on the second trip than the first time. But apparently his wife had not checked the account yet and she just thanked him for being willing to go out and get the better deal. And so Tayeb very happily left the kitchen and he spent the rest of the night watching TV and hanging out with his family. And then early the next morning, Tayeb got up and he decided, you know what? I need to do something to curry some favor with my wife because she's gonna learn what I did with the refund money pretty soon. And so he decided he would just go out and do a bunch of yard work that day, right in front of his wife to make sure she really saw that he was doing some good stuff. And so he goes outside, he opens up the garage, and he's about to pull the lawnmower out when he notices his car is really dirty. And so he decides, you know what, I'm going to go wash my car first and then come back and cut the grass and do some other things. And so he goes inside and he tells his wife what his plan is. And she says, OK, you know, I'll see you in a little bit when you come back from the car wash. And then Tayeb went back outside, he hopped in his car and he left. As he was driving to the car wash, he made a pit stop at a small store that was set back off the road. And so he goes inside and he goes right to the back of this little store where there's this strange machine that looks like an ATM and it has a screen on it with text scrolling across it. And at the bottom, there was an opening where a barcode scanner was kind of projecting down. And so Tayeb walks up to this machine and he reaches into his back pocket and he pulls out those two slips of paper he had got from the grocery store cashier the night before and he puts the first one under the scanner and then he reads the text that appears on the screen of this machine and after reading it he kind of shrugs his shoulders and puts that piece of paper back in his pocket and then the second slip of paper he puts into the scanner and then when he reads the words that pop up on the screen he thinks there's been a mistake because all it says is see receptionist and so he rescans the second slip of paper to see if something different will happen but sure enough again and it just says C receptionist. And so he pulls the second slip of paper out of the scanner. He turns around and he walks to the front of the store and he hands the paper to the woman behind the counter. Over an hour later, Tayeb pulled into his driveway and he sat in his driveway for a second. He was still shaking from what had just happened inside of that small store. And so he gets out of his car, which was still totally dirty. And he made his way into the house and he went straight to the kitchen where his wife was. And so as soon as he gets in the kitchen, his wife turns around and looks at him and says, where were you? The car wash is like five minutes away. Why were you gone for like two hours? But Tayeb, he's got no expression on his face. And he looks at his wife and just says, give me $100. And his wife scrunches her face up at him and says, no, where's your money? And Tayeb smiles. He turns around. He reaches into his back pocket and he pulls out that second slip of paper and he hands it to his wife and he says, here's my money. After getting that $5 refund at the ShopRite in Hackensack, New Jersey, Tayeb noticed a sign on the back wall that was advertising for a Moneyball jackpot lottery. And he had decided to use the $5 refund to buy two lottery tickets. And so he buys these two lottery tickets. And the next day, that store set back off the road he went to was a convenience store, a 7-Eleven. And the machine he was using was a machine that scanned your lottery tickets to see if they were winners. And so the first ticket he scanned, it was a dud. It didn't win anything. But the second ticket, when he scanned it, it couldn't process the amount of money he had just won. And so that's why it told him to see the receptionist. And so he brought the second ticket up to the counter. He handed it to the woman. And after she he scanned it and saw the amount of money he had won, all she could do was say, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And when he asked her, you know, what are you looking at? What happened? She just goes, big. And so when he got home, Tayeb handed that slip to his wife and on it was the amount of money that he had won. He was the jackpot winner. He had won $315 million. Tayeb would say that he and his wife and his kids all laughed and cried and celebrated in the kitchen all night. And within a couple of days, Tayeb had left his job, he retired, and he had paid off all of his family's debts. And at his press conference for the New Jersey Lottery, he was quoted as saying, I love orange juice now.
In 2012, someone went on Reddit and asked people to share their personal glitch in the matrix stories. A glitch in the matrix story is any story where something totally unusual happens that doesn't have a logical explanation. So these are true stories, or at least purported to be true, they're first-hand accounts, and they're very popular on Reddit. And so this particular query on Reddit got very popular, it went totally viral, and so there were thousands and thousands of stories commented down down below. So lots of people gave their glitch in the matrix story. Now the top comments, so the top stories that were given were really, really interesting, but by far the best response, the best glitch in the matrix story got no attention at all. It was buried at the bottom of 14,000 plus comments. This story, which was written by a person who just went by Sarah X 11 should have gone completely viral. It should have been the top comment by far, but for whatever reason, it wasn't. And so now 10 years later, no one really knows about it. While we don't know for sure if Sarah X 11s story is true, as it is just an unverified first-hand account, what we do know is that this was the first story that Sarah X 11 had ever posted to Reddit about glitches in the matrix. The majority of her Reddit activity consisted of liking cute pictures of cats and dogs. So this person, this user, was not on Reddit for clout. Also, when Sarah X 11 posted her story in this Reddit thread, there were already thousands and thousands of comments posted. So if they were trying to get recognized through this story, they chose the worst post to do it on. If you want to get recognized in a comment section and be a top comment, typically you have to be one of the very first comments after this thing gets posted. And so she's posting after thousands and thousands of people have done this. So in my mind, it seems like this post by Sarah X 11, this story has got to be true. And even if it isn't true, it's one of the coolest stories I've come across on the internet that is guaranteed to give you goosebumps. Okay, here we go. In 2006, a 20 year old woman named Sarah started having some very strange dreams about a woman named Aurora. She had a very striking face with sharp features and long black hair. Now, her dreams varied. Sometimes Sarah was in a crowd of people, or she was at her office, or she was just alone in a room. But in all of her dreams, Aurora would always show up. Either she would interact with Aurora and they would speak, but Sarah could never remember what they actually spoke about, or Aurora would just be in the crowd or in the background just watching Sarah. Now, she had these dreams enough that eventually Sarah began to think, I must know someone named Aurora. I must have come across this person, and now they're just kind of manifesting in my brain at night when I'm sleeping. And so she began going through her older posts on social media to look in pictures of her and of her friends to see if there was a woman with striking features and long black hair that was this Aurora person in her dream. But after looking through hundreds and hundreds of pictures, she couldn't find any indication that she had met this person, at least not according to her social media. Media. And so Sarah began just going on Google and typing in Aurora, long black hair, striking features. Has anybody dreamed about this? To see if there were people talking about having this type of dream on the internet. But she had no luck. Eventually, after about three or four months of having these strange dreams that Aurora was in, Aurora stopped showing up in Sarah's dreams. It was like it suddenly was all over. And so very quickly, Sarah just kind of forgot about it. A few years later, on Halloween night 2009, Sarah and a friend pulled off the highway into a gas station. They had been out with some friends celebrating Halloween, and now they were making their way back home. Sarah pulled into an empty spot right in front of the convenience store, and after they were parked, Sarah and her friend got out, they went inside, they got some snacks and drinks, and then they came back outside and climbed back into Sarah's car. A few moments later, Sarah had turned her car on, she had backed out, and she had driven past all of the gas station pumps and she was making her way towards the single lane strip of road that merged out onto the highway. It was how anybody who got into this gas station got back out onto the highway. And so as she's getting closer to the entrance of this short merge road, her phone suddenly rings. What happens next occurred over a span of just a few seconds. So it might seem like this is over several minutes, but this all happened pretty much simultaneously. 
So she's pulling up to the entrance of this merge road. Her cell phone rings, and because there was no one behind her, it was not a busy night, Sarah decides to just stop her car, put it in park so she can safely take this phone call. And so she stops her car pretty much right in front of the entrance to this merge road, and she picks up her phone, she looks at the number, and she doesn't recognize it, but she picks it up anyways, and she says, hello. There was silence on her phone, and as Sarah is saying, hello, is anybody there? Another car from the gas station pulls up right behind Sarah's car, and they start honking their horn immediately. They are in a huge rush. And so Sarah, who's totally embarrassed that she's blocking traffic, she hangs up the phone, she puts it down, she puts her car back in drive, and she hits the gas. But this driver behind her is apparently in such a rush, they're so impatient, that they actually swerved around her, driving on the dirt off to the side of the road just to get around her, and then they sped off down the merge road back onto the highway. And literally, seconds later, another car that was already on the highway, a silver Honda Civic, lost control and smashed into this car that had just passed Sarah's car. So there's this huge car accident literally right in front of Sarah and her friend who have now stopped the car they're right at the end of the merge road looking at this horrible accident that they narrowly escaped sarah put her car back in park she picked up her phone and she called the police when the police showed up a few moments later they took down sarah and her friend's version of events and then a little while later after the ambulances had left and after the two cars had been pulled off of the highway one of the police officers pulled Sarah aside and told her that the driver of the Honda Civic and the driver of the car that had swerved around her had both been killed in the accident. Shocked, the only thing Sarah could think to do was to call back that number she didn't recognize that had effectively stopped her from getting onto the highway and maybe even stopped her from being hit by that Honda Civic. And so she wanted to talk to this person and thank them for saving her life. But when she called the number back, the person did not pick up. However, it went to her voicemail and it said, Hi, you've reached Aurora. Leave your name and number after the beep. Sarah could not believe it. She said she had never felt goosebumps like that in her entire life. The next day, Sarah tried calling the number again, and this time the woman, Aurora, answered the phone. The two got to talking, and Sarah explained her crazy dreams, and now this crazy car crash thing, and how it's all connected, and Aurora would tell Sarah, like, that's amazing, this is a crazy story you're telling me, except I didn't call you last night. I have no idea how you got my phone number. And so at the end of this phone call, the two women really had not reached any sort of explanation for how this came to be, how they came to be talking. But they ultimately just said, okay, hey, you know, thanks and uh, best of luck to you. And then they hung up. After the call was over, Sarah found herself just kind of sitting there, not really sure how to react to what had just happened. It was such a totally bizarre thing that she had just been through over the past 24 hours. And then if you include the dream, this has been a multi-year long thing. And so on a whim, Sarah just opens up her Facebook account and she plugs in Aurora's full name because Aurora had given her her full name on this phone call they had just had. And when she looked at her phone, when the results came in, Sarah nearly fainted. Right at the top of the results page was this woman, Aurora's Facebook account. And her profile picture showed her face. And when Sarah looked at her face, it was the exact same face she had seen so many times in her dreams. It was the same Aurora with the striking features and long black hair. The woman in her dreams was the woman who called her and saved her life. On the evening of January 6th, 1982, a man named Harold Bray, who was a sheriff in Jefferson County, Colorado, which is an area just west of Denver, arrived at the Denver airport. Harold was running late because his commute into the airport had been treacherous because Denver and the surrounding areas were all getting pounded by a snowstorm. After running into the terminal and getting checked in and getting through security, he made it to his gate right as they were boarding the plane. Feeling very relieved, Harold joined the queue of other people that were getting on the ramp to go down into the plane. And then just a couple of minutes later, he stepped on board and he found his seat, which was located at the front right side of the plane. He sat down in his seat, he buckled in, and then he grabbed an in-flight magazine from the back pocket of the chair in front of him, and he waited for takeoff. Fifteen minutes later, as the plane was rumbling down the runway at full speed, Harold looked out the window. 
And so as the plane began to lift off the ground, he watched as the city lights of Denver slowly faded away as they got higher and higher up. But just before their plane entered into the thick cloud that was hovering over that stretch of Colorado, Harold noticed something very odd out of his window. Located just west of Jefferson County, which is where Harold worked, was a 22-mile stretch of road that cut through the Rocky Mountains. It was called the Guanella Pass, and it took motorists up and over this 11,000-foot mountain pass. Now, this was a beautiful scenic drive that Harold was very familiar with, but this road was not maintained in the wintertime. So if there was snow on the ground, you simply could not get through this pass. It was impossible. Yet, as Harold looked out of his plane window down to Jefferson County below, and he kind of scanned his way west up into the Rockies, he saw there were clearly a car's headlights on the Guanella Pass. And so Harold's thinking to himself, why in the world would anyone be on the Guanella Pass in the middle of this huge snowstorm? It didn't make any sense. But as Harold watched this vehicle, he saw what was going on. Whoever was in this vehicle was holding a flashlight out of their window, and they were shining the light straight up into the sky, flashing it on and off, signaling distress. This motorist was trapped. Harold knew the likelihood of another plane happening to fly over this area and looking down and seeing those lights and recognizing them for what they were, an emergency, were slim to none. So Harold knew if he didn't act quickly, this motorist was doomed. And so Harold quickly got up from his seat, he climbed over the person next to him, he got into the aisle, and he waved down the attendant, and then after the attendant ran over, Harold explained who he was and why his experience as a sheriff told him that this was an emergency. And so the attendant took him very seriously, they turned around, they went into the cockpit, and they told the pilots, and the pilots used their radios to call down to authorities on the ground. And then just a couple of minutes later, the fire department was dispatched to Guanella Pass. Fifteen minutes later, the fire chief, a man named Dave Montoya, who was driving in a four-wheel drive SUV, arrived at the start of this 22-mile stretch of mountain pass, and as they're driving through the whipping snow, he sees up ahead the headlights of the stranded vehicle. And so he drives right up alongside this vehicle, which was a small pickup truck that had clearly slid off the road and gotten stuck in a big snowbank. And so Dave, he parks his SUV, he hops out and he rushes over to the driver's side window of this vehicle. And inside was a terrified looking 30 year old man named Alan Phillips, who was a mechanic who lived in the Denver area. Now, at the time, it was the middle of the night, it's negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit outside, the winds are whipping, the snow is coming down, and Alan only had on a light jacket and some jeans and a small blanket wrapped around him. So, had Harold not spotted his flashlight SOS signal from the plane, it's almost guaranteed that Alan would have died that night from hypothermia. And so when Alan turned and saw Dave standing there, his rescuer, Alan began crying tears of joy and thanking God that he was going to survive. When Dave asked Alan what happened, Alan, who was slightly intoxicated, told Dave that he had gone out drinking at a bar, and then when it was time to come home, he had stupidly decided to drive through the Guanella Pass back to his home, forgetting that this particular stretch of road was not maintained during the winter. When Dave asked Alan how he got this really deep bruise on his cheek, you know, he assumed he got it from crashing off the side of the road, Alan smiled a kind of embarrassed smile and said, no, actually, after I got stuck, I needed to urinate, and so I got out of the vehicle and I walked a few paces away from my truck and I went to the bathroom and then when I turned to walk back the snow was so blinding I couldn't actually see my truck and I ran to go find it again because I didn't want to be trapped out in the snow and I ran into the truck face first and so my cheek hit the door of the truck and so Dave he just smiled and said Alan you are one lucky man over the next few days, local newspapers in Colorado and some national newspapers ran headlines about the miracle at Guanella Pass. However, as it would turn out, that headline would not age well. 38 years later, in 2020, it was discovered that Alan had lied to Dave about why he was in Guanella Pass. The truth was, 
earlier in the evening that Allen would eventually get stuck. He had murdered two hitchhikers near Breckenridge, Colorado, roughly 50 miles from the Guanella Pass. Both of these murders had gone cold, but in late 2020, DNA evidence connected Allen to both cases. Several hours before Allen got rescued, he picked up 22-year-old Annette Schnee, who was hitchhiking, and after she got into his truck, it's believed he held her at gunpoint and then put zip tie handcuffs on her wrists. And then we don't really know what happened next, but at some point that night, Annette was taken out of the vehicle and led into the woods and she was shot in the back and she was left face down in a stream. A couple of hours after he killed Annette, Allen picked up another hitchhiker, 29-year-old Barbara Oberholzer, and when she got into his truck, it's believed he did the same thing. He held her at gunpoint and put her in zip-tie handcuffs. However, Barbara was able to break out of her restraints. It's believed she struck Allen in the cheek, which is why he got that deep bruise on his cheek, and then she leapt out of his car and started running. But Alan got out, chased her down, and shot her in the chest, killing her. And then he dumped her body off the side of this cliff down into the snowbank below. So the only reason Alan got stuck in Guinella Pass is because he was attempting to flee the area where he committed these murders. And he likely just didn't understand how dangerous this pass was. And so shortly after turning onto it, his truck slid off the road and he got stuck. In February of 2021, Alan, who was 70 years old at the time and still living in the Denver area, was finally arrested for these two murders, and he is currently awaiting trial. Assuming he did it, that Alan killed these two women, we don't know what his motivations were. It's not clear he hasn't said, and we also don't know if there are potentially other victims. So that's going to do it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please invite the like button to participate in your very fun, casual neighborhood squirt gun fight, but then squirt the like button with sulfuric acid, not water. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly one or two video uploads. We now have a podcast called Mr. Ball and Podcast, where we put out brand new, never before heard stories every Monday morning. We also put out remastered audio from our most popular YouTube videos on Thursday morning. So again, the name of the podcast is just Mr. Ball and Podcast, and you can find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, basically anywhere you get your podcasts, you can find it there. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform. My username for all of them is just at Mr. Ballin, and then just send me a direct message. I really do read the majority of my DMs. We have two additional YouTube channels. One is just called Mr ball in shorts where we post random short videos and lost episodes and the other channel is called mr ballin and espanol and it is a spanish language channel we have a facebook page just called mr ballin that puts out near daily content and we also have a snapchat channel also just called mr ballin that puts out content on sundays we also have some really cool merchandise so head on over to shop to have a look and if you have a story suggestion please submit it to our subreddit just called mr ballin and it's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, Facebook, other YouTube channels, the podcast, wherever, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.